The uh, committee uh, will come to uh, order. The uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, was one of the worst public health crises that our country has ever faced. We lost more than one million Americans to the virus, family members and neighbors, friends and colleagues, and millions more died around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic led to a once in a generation event that not only threatened our public health, but also created unprecedented challenges to our economic and homeland security, as well as our, our very way of life. As Americans navigated the COVID-19 pandemic, they endured challenge, uh, changing health care guidance, uh, uncertainty and misinformation about how to best protect themselves and their families from this deadly virus. Today's hearing is intended to examine the available scientific evidence related to the virus that causes COVID-19 and provides some transparency to Americans who are continuing to have to navigate their exposure to the virus. As chairman of uh, this committee, I led an investigation into the federal government's initial pandemic response. The report was called historically unprepared and included recommendations on how we can ensure that we're better prepared to prevent and respond to future pandemics. This March, I also launched a bipartisan biosecurity and life science research investigation with ranking member Paul to look into a wide range of constantly evolving biological risk and threats to better enhance our preparedness for future incidents. This morning, we're going to hear from academic experts who can discuss how COVID-19 pandemic may have started and how we can learn from this outbreak to better address future potential infectious disease outbreaks and protect human life. Better understanding of the possible origins of COVID-19 pandemic is not only important to our public health, it is also a matter of homeland security. We must learn from the challenges faced during this pandemic to ensure we can better protect Americans from future potential biological incident. Our government needs the flexibility to determine the origins of naturally occurring outbreaks as well as potential outbreaks that could arise from mistakes or malicious intent. All that said, the history has shown us it is seldom simple or straightforward to identify the singular cause of an infectious disease outbreak. It can take months or years to pinpoint an origin, and in some cases, we may never find the answer. This is also the case with COVID-19. There are theories that indicate that COVID-19 began either by entering the human population through an entirely natural means or possibly through a lab incident or accident. Given the likelihood that the Chinese government may never fully disclose all the information they have about the initial COVID-19 outbreak, we must use the scientific information available to better prepare for future potential pandemics. We must not only examine the scientific information we have about COVID-19, but also the tools and procedures the government has in place to understand such viral outbreaks and how we can prevent them from becoming widespread in the future. Today's hearing and our panel of expert witnesses will help us understand how the most recent pandemic began so that we can take necessary steps to protect the American people from future biological threats. I'd now I'd like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Paul for his opening remarks. Today we are here to examine one of the most critical and debated questions of our time. Did COVID-19 originate in a lab? To answer this question, let's revisit the early days of the pandemic and examine what some of Dr. Anthony Fauci's inner circle said privately about the origins of the virus. Discussions that were only revealed through FOIA litigation. Christian Anderson wrote, the lab escape version of this is so friggin' likely to have happened because they were already doing this type of work and the molecular data is fully consistent with that scenario. Ian Lipkin stressed the nightmare of circumstantial evidence to assess regarding the possibility of inadvertent release given the scale of bat coronavirus research pursued in Wuhan. Bob Gary said, 
I really can't think of a plausible national, natural scenario where you get from the bad virus or one very similar to it to COVID-19, where you insert exactly four amino acids, 12 nucleotides, and all have to be added at the exact same time to gain this function. I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature. According to Gary, it's not crackpot to suggest this could have happened given the gain of function research we know what's happening at Wuhan. These are all private statements, which you'll discover today differ greatly from their public statements. Even Ralph Barrick, world famous gain of function researcher and collaborator with Wuhan's Dr. Xi admitted, so they, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, have a very large collection of viruses in their laboratory. And so it's, you know, proximity is a problem. It's a problem. Federal court orders reveal that even Dr. Fauci himself privately acknowledged concerns about gain-of-function research in Wuhan and mutations in the virus that suggest it might have been engineered just days before he commissioned the proximal origin paper. Despite these private doubts, publicly these so-called experts and their allies were dismissing the lab leak theory as a conspiracy. Within days, Anderson, Lipkin, and Gary were putting final touches on what would be remembered as one of the most remarkable reversals in modern history. In their proximal origin paper, these scientists concluded, we do not believe that any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible. Privately, they were saying one thing. Publicly, they were saying another. Media pundits parroted the narrative while social media platforms censored discussion about the lab leak, labeling it as misinformation and stifling open discourse about the virus's origins. The cover-up went beyond public statements. Federal agencies and key officials withheld and continued to conceal crucial information from both Congress and the public. For instance, David Morenz, Dr. David Morenz of the NIH deleted emails that could have contained valuable insights into early discussions. When he deleted them, he made the comment, I think we're safe now. He deleted emails. He said, the early emails I've deleted to Peter Dayzak at EcoHealth, I think we're safe now. The ODNI failed to comply with a law that was passed unanimously. One of the senators on this committee got it passed. We were going to declassify all this and revealed it and the administration has refused. HHS and NIH have not produced documents related to the gain-of-function research that the chairman and I requested nearly a year ago. I've been asking for two or three years as an individual member with some other Republican members and have not gotten these records. I've now asked with the Democrat chairman over a year, and they're still resisting. They say it's not gain-of-function. Well, let's hear the debate. Did they debate at NIH whether it was gain of function in Wuhan? If there's a debate, let's hear the scientific arguments on both sides. They will not give us that information. This has been a deliberate, prolonged effort to deceive the committee about certain gain of function research experiments that the agencies have been withholding. What we have found as we've gone through this is that at every step, there's been resistance. So the hearing today is to try to find out whether or not we can get to the truth. Do we know for certain it came from the lab? No, but there's a preponderance of evidence indicating that it may have come from the lab. Do we know viruses have come from animals in the past? Yes, they've come from animals in the past. But this time there's no animal reservoir. There's no animal handlers with antibiotics. There's a lot of reasons why there are indications that this could well have come from the lab. This is what the discussion we'll have today. This is a discussion that's long in coming. It's been over three years that we've been asking for this, but this is great. This is good. We'll have scientists on both sides of this issue, and I hope we have a spirited debate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ricky Member Paul. It is the uh, practice of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if each of you would please stand and uh, raise uh, your right hands. Do you swear the testimony that you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I Thank you. Uh, you may be seated. Our first witness is uh, Dr. Gregory uh, Koblitz. Uh, he is an associate professor and director of the Biodefense Graduate Program at George Mason University's Shar uh, 
School of uh, Policy and Government. He serves as editor-in-chief of the Pandora, uh, Pandora Report, an online newsletter that covers global health security, and as co-director of the Global BioLabs Initiative that tracks high security labs and bio-risk management policies uh, uh, around the world. Dr. Koblitz, uh, you are now recognized uh, for your opening statement. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Paul, and other members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about the uh, origins of COVID-19 and its implications for U.S. biodefense and global health security. Um, I've been conducting research and teaching on biodefense, uh, global health security, and bio-risk management for the last 25 years, uh, both at, um, at the Shar School at George Mason, as you, as you indicated. I come before you today in my personal capacity, um, and my views do not represent those of George Mason or the other organizations with which I am affiliated. Uh, I've submitted a lengthy written statement to you, uh, which I will not uh, go over today in, in detail, but I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you have about it uh, during the, the rest of the hearing. Uh, what I'd like to do is just highlight some key points. Uh, first, let me directly address the main topic of the hearing today, the available evidence on the origins of COVID-19. Uh, more than four years after the start of the pandemic, uh, the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus remains a subject of debate. There are two pandemic pathways that have been widely discussed to explain how SARS-CoV-2 emerged in Wuhan in 2019 a natural spillover event um, from animals to humans, or an actual release of a pathogen from a laboratory. The possibility that SARS-CoV-2 was deliberately developed as a biological weapon has been unanimously rejected by all U.S. intelligence agencies. Uh, while the intelligence community is divided on the origin of the pandemic, uh, most of the agencies uh, have determined that the virus was not genetically engineered. I believe the available evidence uh, points most strongly to a natural zoonotic spillover event as the origin of the pandemic. However, a research-related accident can't be ruled out at this time. A key obstacle to more uh, definitive conclusion is the lack of transparency exercised by the Chinese government, which affects assessments of both potential pathways to the pandemic. Until there's an independent international transparent investigation, uh, it's unlikely we'll be, come up, be able to come up with a more definitive conclusion that'll satisfy both sides of the debate. Uh, it's not my intention to review this debate today. Instead of looking backwards, I prefer to look forwards uh, and plan for the future. The reality is that we're not as well prepared to prevent, detect, uh, respond to, or recover from a biological incident or pandemic as we should be, regardless of its origin. The growing H5N1 outbreak in the United States is a testament to the challenges we currently face and the urgency of addressing them. The difficulty in determining the origin of COVID-19 is not unusual. Among the outbreaks and pandemics we've ex already experienced this century, it's taken years to identify the origin of a novel pathogen, sometimes in only general terms. Rarely is it possible to identify the exact sequence of events that led to the first human infection that sparked a pandemic. Determining the origin of an uh, outbreak or pandemic can be divided into four stages, detection, identification, characterization, and attribution. Understanding how a specific pathogen entered and spread in a population to cause an outbreak is a multidisciplinary undertaking uh, that requires expertise in epidemiology, human medicine, veterinary medicine, biology, genetics, bioinformatics, ecology, anthropology, and related fields. Seeking the origin of an outbreak requires collecting and analyzing a large amount of data collected from diverse sources by a range of agencies with a variety of scientific capabilities and disciplinary specializations. The quality of the data and the rigor of the epidemiological and scientific investigation will affect the level of confidence we have in these determinations. Uh, determinations of the origin of a pandemic or an outbreak are rarely definitive and need to be carefully qualified to reflect the strength of available evidence as well as gaps and uncertainties. Determining the origin of an outbreak can uh, improve the effectiveness of response to an ongoing incident, reduce the likelihood of uh, or magnitude of future uh, incidents, or even prevent future outbreaks altogether. Making this determination, however, is not always straightforward or successful. The process of investigating the source of an outbreak is like putting together a puzzle where you don't know what the final picture will look like, uh, the pieces change shape and move around, and pieces are added and moved as you're trying to solve the puzzle. Uh, there are also several factors that can influence the success of an origin investigation, uh, including the passage of time, the biology, epidemiology of the specific pathogen, um, limited scientific knowledge about novel pathogens, local and national politics, and economic considerations. We saw each of these factors at play in Wuhan in 2019 and 2020. Indeed, we see similar factors at play uh, in the response to the current H5N1 outbreak in the United States as well. The key point is to determine the origin of an outbreak uh, or a biological incident is scientifically complex, but can also be politically fraught and subject to countervailing pressures by other actors with an interest in obscuring or delaying or halting the outcome of investigation. So what should be done to improve our ability to determine the origins of a biological incident? 
Uh, I recommend that this Congress, working with the Biden administration, invest in strengthening biosurveillance and bio-risk management in the United States and internationally. This will not only enhance our ability to determine the origins of future incidents, uh, but also improve our capabilities to prevent them uh, and respond more uh, successfully to prevent an outbreak from becoming a pandemic. Biosurveillance in the United States suffers from fragmentation, a chronic underinvestment in state and local public health capacity, uh, and the lack of capacity to rapidly develop and deploy diagnostics. Um, in my written statement, I provide further recommendations uh, about biosurveillance. In interest of time, I'll get just to the uh, uh, recommendations on biorisk management. Uh, and this is a field that encompasses a field in laboratory biosafety, laboratory biosecurity, and oversight of dual use research. Even if the origins of COVID-19 is uh, proven to be the result of a natural zoonotic spillover event, the pandemic raised important questions about the efficacy of our oversight of dual use research of concern, including uh, with pathogens with enhanced transmissibility or um, virulence. Uh, the pandemic has also dramatically illustrated the consequences if such a pathogen escapes from a lab and sparks a pandemic. Regardless of one's views on the origin of the pandemic, we should all be able to agree that we want to minimize the risk that a future pandemic could be caused by a laboratory accident. Last month, the Biden administration released a new U.S. government policy for oversight of dual-use research of concern, which represents a significant step forward in oversight of um, high-consequence research. There are two immediate steps that Congress could take to enhance implementation of this policy. First, Congress could support the Biden administration's efforts to provide education and training to the um, wide array of stakeholders who are now going to be affected by this policy. This policy uh, now covers 95 biological agents and toxins, up from 14, and so there's a much wider swath of biological community that's now going to be subject to oversight, and they need to understand this policy in order to implement it effectively. Uh, Congress also needs to pass legislation to close a loophole in the current policy that um, uh, allows privately funded research, including that with uh, uh, engineering of, of pathogens, uh, to continue without uh, any oversight. Uh, and I think it's in the power of Congress to solve that fairly uh, easily. Over the longer term, Congress needs to modernize the U.S. virus management um, system. Um, I think the most effective way to do that would be creation of an independent federal agency that would be responsible for virus management uh, across both um, uh, publicly and privately funded um, enterprises. Um, in conclusion, we, have, uh, uh, we know enough about the two different pathways uh, to a pandemic, both the demonstrated route of natural transmission, the potential of laboratory accident, uh, that we have enough information now that we can take action that will significantly reduce the risk posed by both types of risks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koblitz. Um, our second wit uh, witness is uh, Dr. Robert Gary. He is a professor of microbiology and immunology and an associate dean for biomedical sciences at Tulane School of Medicine. Dr. Gary has been a professor of virology for over 40 years and has performed groundbreaking work in diagnostics for emerging pathogens, including the Ebola virus. Dr. Gary, welcome to the committee. You uh, are now recognized for your opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Paul, distinguished members of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. As uh, Chairman Peters says, I'm a professor and associate dean at Tulane School of Medicine in New Orleans. And the reason you may know me is because I'm an author on a peer-reviewed paper that appeared in Nature Medicine entitled The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. In the Proximal Origins paper, my co-authors and I discussed several different possible origins of SARS-CoV-2. The three possible origins for the virus that are most relevant to today's discussion are, one, direct spillover from a bat to a human, two, spillover from a bat to an intermediate animal and then to a human, and three, lab origin. At the time of writing the Proximal Origin paper in early February to mid-March 2020, we did not rule out any of these three pathways. Based on the current available evidence, I believe that the most plausible origin of SARS-CoV-2 is spillover from a bat to an intermediate animal and then to a human. I further believe the available evidence indicates that this spillover happened naturally, likely at the Anand Seafood Market in Wuhan, China. I do not believe that the available scientific evidence, when considered holistically, supports that the virus was created in a lab at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. However, I am first and foremost a scientist, and I will adhere to the scientific method so I will continue to, to evaluate new evidence and reassess the validity of my scientific hypotheses regarding the origins of SARS-CoV-2. I look forward to continuing the scientific debate 
in peer-reviewed materials with other scientists, including those here today, regarding our different perspectives and interpretations of the evidence. That said, I'm heartened by the attention this committee, this committee is giving to a very timely and important topic, gain-of-function research. I welcome this opportunity to engage in an open and constructive conversation about the risk and benefits and appropriate safeguards and restrictions on this research. As Chairman Peters mentioned again before, I've been a virology professor for over 40 years. I've seen firsthand the damage that emerging viruses can cause. I researched HIV before we knew the profound impacts this emerging virus would have on all of society and while the American public was still fearful of blood transfusions. I was present in Sierra Leone at the outbreak of Ebola in 2014 and witnessed the death toll and heartbreak, including many close friends and colleagues who succumbed. I am currently developing countermeasures to Lassa virus, a deadly hemorrhagic fever virus with up to a 70% case fatality. So I understand, perhaps better than most, the importance of assuring appropriate safeguards for research, including adequate oversight of funding, rules and guidelines regarding study design, including the types of viruses that require oversight, and universal standards for the use of appropriate protective gear when handling highly transmissible or pathogenic viruses, viruses in the laboratory or in field studies. But I also know the vital role of responsibly performed research, including on highly transmissible and pathogenic viruses. It advances public health and national security. Without gain-of-function research, we'd have no Tamiflu. Without gain-of-function research, we wouldn't have a vaccine to prevent cancer caused by infection by the human papillomavirus. And without gain-of-function research, we won't be able to identify how novel viruses infect us. And if we don't know how they infect us, we cannot develop appropriate treatments and cures for the next potential pandemic creating virus. So I, I also encourage the committee to empower the scientific enterprise to address the certainty of viral threats that emerge from nature in the future. For example, potential pandemic viruses can infiltrate commercial animal farming industries. The wildlife trade in China was the only enterprise in the world comparable in size to the United States cattle industry. Multiple spillovers of SARS-CoV, the first SARS, occurred in 2002 through 2004, and they came from the Chinese wildlife trade. Evidence similarly indicates that this likely happened again with SARS-CoV-2 in 2019. I hope we treat these incidents as a stark and timely reminder that this can happen anywhere in the world. In fact, it's happening right in our backyard with the serious threat from bird flu that it poses to our United States cattle industry. As a member of NIID's Center for Research in Emerging Infectious Diseases, or CREED Network, I know that gain-of-function research can be done responsibly and safely. The new guidance from the Office of Science Technology Policy shows that research with high-risk pathogens and the types of experiments that require review can be clearly defined in a way that does not obstruct low-risk research. I'm honored to be a part of this important conversation that will help define the future of a vitally important area of virology, and I urge the members of this committee to find a path forward that permits appropriate gain-of-function research to continue to help ensure our public health and national security. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gary. Our, our next two witnesses uh, will be introduced by Ranking Member Paul. Stephen Quay is an MD, PhD. He's the CEO of Atosa Therapeutics, a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company developing novel therapeutics for oncology. Dr. Quay has authored 400 publications in the field of medicine, including 32 on the origin of SARS CoV 2. His work has been cited over 12,000 times, placing him in the top 1% of scientists worldwide. His paper, A Bayesian Analysis, concludes beyond a reasonable doubt that SARS-CoV-2 is not a natural zoonosis, but instead is laboratory-derived. This article has been viewed over 206,000 times. Dr. Quay holds 238 U.S. patents and patent applications in 22 areas of medicine, including RNA chemistry, coronavirus therapeutics. Before his current role, he was a member of the Department of Pathology at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Quay, welcome to the committee. You are now recognized for your opening statement. Committee Chair Senator Peters, Ranking Member Senator Paul, Committee Members, Invited Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. 
I am a physician scientist and have a 50-year career spanning academic medical research, biotechnology, and scientific fraud investigation. My biography summarizes my career. I speak today, however, as an independent scientist. I do not receive any NIH or NIAID funding. Scientists dependent on NIH or NIAID funding may have pressure to publicly agree with orthodoxies that privately they admit are wrong. My approach to the COVID pandemic origin that killed 20 million plus people, caused $20 trillion in economic damage, is based on six approaches to the data and the events. I'll start with something Dr. Gary said privately, quote, someone should tell Nature, meaning the British Journal, that the fish market probably did not start the outbreak, end quote. I agree with Dr. Gary. Unfortunately, one reason we are having these hearings is that the public statements of many virologists have not been congruent with their private conversations. In any case, I'll describe the six approaches to the question that all support a lab leak as a source and can go deeper into each of those with questions. First, the virus was spreading in Wuhan and around the world in the fall of 2019, months before the first case in the Hunan seafood market. This is supported by 14 observations or evidence. The evidence includes the calculation of the time to the most recent common ancestor, hospital overloads in Wuhan, antibodies in patients from Italy, Spain, and the US, wastewater samples from Brazil, sick athletes at the October Wuhan military games, school closings in Wuhan, <clears throat> and dozens of documented patients. This dismisses out of hand the market as the origin. But second, let's look at the market data. The human infections, the animal samples, and the environmental specimens, these generate eight observations. No infected animals in the market or the supply chain were infected. No infected wildlife vendors were in, had SARS. All human infections are the non-ancestral lineage B. The environmental specimens with animal DNA have no SARS-2. One vendor had animals from southern China where SARS-2 came from, but this vendor and his animals are negative for SARS-2. Now, only one of 14 environmental samples with raccoon dog DNA contains SARS reads, and that contains one read out of 210 million. 13 of the 14 raccoon dog DNA specimens had no SARS-2. With SARS-1, literally 100% of the market animals were infected. I frankly think it is shameful for scientists to mislead journalists and the public saying these data I just described are evidence raccoon dogs were infected with SARS-2. This is why trust in science is broken. None of these data are consistent with an infected animal passing SARS-2 to a human at the market. The 1,500 kilometer distance to the nearest SARS-2 related virus is like the distance from Washington, D.C. to the Florida Everglades. Imagine you're at dinner at a restaurant in North Bethesda near the NIAID labs. You get sick and you are told that the virus you caught is only found in bats from the Everglades, but it also happens to be under study at the laboratories you, you see outside the restaurant window. That's what the market origin people are asking you to believe. Third, documented events at or related to Wuhan Institute of Virology beginning in March 2019 are consistent with the expected activities when a lab-acquired infection has occurred. This timeline includes unusual attention from the Chinese Communist Party, uh, leading to the PLA physician soldier being put in charge. Large tender requests to repair biosafety equipment. A virus database disappearing in the middle of the night. Large tender requests for a lab security force to, quote, handle foreign personnel end quote. Patents for a device to prevent a lab-acquired infection. Rumors in the virology community of a new SARS virus in the lab. 30 vials of the three most dangerous viruses on the planet being shipped illegally from a lab in Canada to WIV in March. And then one of those pathogens being found as a major contaminant in a BLSA lab in December. These events taken together are a classic example of closing the barn door after the horse has left. Fourth, the evidence that is found in a natural zoonosis with respect to the animal host, the virus, and the human are missing with COVID. 96,000 animals were tested and are negative for SARS-2. 43,000 blood samples from blood donors in Wuhan were tested. A natural spillover like SARS-1 would have produced about 260 positives. A, labs, a lab accident would be, would be zero, and of course, zero is what is found. With respect to the virus, a spillover produces posterior diversity in the virus genome. A lab leak does not. SARS-2 has no posterior diversity. 
Natural spillovers, as Dr. Gary indicated this morning, involve multiple markets. SARS-1 began in southern China, had 11 spillovers in 11 different markets in nine different cities. Christian Anderson, the proximal origin in SARS-2, uh, SARS said SARS-2 was one person being infected with one animal. I agree. Fifth, the genome of SARS-2 has eight features found in a synthetic virus that are not found in natural viruses. The probability that SARS-2 came from nature based on these features is one in a billion. These features are the backbone, the receptor binding domain, the furin cleavage site, the genetics of the furin cleavage site, the number, location, and pattern of clothing, clothing, cloning sites in SARS-2 that use the Barrick cloning method and the ORF8 gene. Based on SARS-2 cloning sites, I predicted how SARS-2 could be made in the laboratory. A year later, Barrick used the predicted steps to make an infectious clone of SARS-2. These same features were described in a 2018 DARPA grant by WIV and U.S. scientists. With respect to the grant, SARS-2 had the proposed back backbone from the proposed region in China, the proposed adaption to human killing, the proposed diversity from SARS-1, the proposed noceum cleavage site number, location, and pattern, the proposed human cleavage site at the proposed S1, S2 junction. Let's close with a thought experiment. It's 2018. Do you think a market spillover of a coronavirus could have happened in Wuhan? Dr. Dasik and Xi have studied coronaviruses for a decade, and they said no. How do I know that? Because they used Wuhan residents as control for a study looking for antibodies in coronaviruses in people living near bat caves in southern China. The rural residents had a 3% rate. Wuhan residents had zero. Let's flip that and, and ask the, the reverse question. Do you think a lab-acquired infection could begin in Wuhan, a city with the world's leading laboratory collecting coronavirus from nature, doing synthetic biology on coronaviruses, doing petri dish and animal research on coronavirus with a bat colony for testing, and that had written a blueprint to make a coronavirus that had seven unique features found in SARS-CoV-2? I'll, I'll let you answer that question yourself. I have a number of re specific reforms I believe should be implemented, and I would be happy to discuss them during the questioning. What happens if we have these hearings and nothing happens? The Wuhan Institute of Virology right now is testing a Nipah virus uh, in a synthetic clone. This is a US CDA, uh, CDC bioterrorism agent. It kills three out of four people. A lab leak with an airborne Nipah virus would quickly, within weeks, disrupt food and energy distribution, fire and police services, medical care. My analysis of this tipping point event is that it would set back civilization about 250 years. The work of this committee is critical. If we now fail to act with the knowledge we have history, if it can still be recorded, we'll judge us poorly. Thank you for your time. Governors, thank you. Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Rutgers University. He also serves as the laboratory director for the Waxman Institute of Microbiology, a position he has held for 37 years. Dr. Ebright has authored over 185 peer-reviewed publications and holds more than 45 issued and pending U.S. patents. He's the co-founder of Biosafety Now and a member of the advisory board of the Global Biolabs Project and the Institutional Biosafety Committee at Rutgers University. Previously, he served as on the Antimicrobial Resistance Committee for Infectious Disease Society of America, the Controlling Dangerous Pathogens Project, and the Path Pathogen Security Working Group for the state of New Jersey. Dr. Ebright, welcome to the committee. You are now recognized for your opening statement. Chairman Peters, member Paul, Ranking Member Paul, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the origins of COVID-19. I'm Board of Governors Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Rutgers University and Laboratory Director at the Waxman Institute of Microbiology. In my statement, I will present my assessment of the origin of COVID and will summarize key lines of evidence that support my assessment. I assess that a large preponderance of evidence indicates SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, entered humans through a research incident. I base this assessment on information in publicly available documents, press reports, and scientific papers, on my research experience in microbial genomics, microbial genetics, DNA synthesis technology, and recombinant DNA technology, and on my knowledge of and experience with biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk management for work with pathogens. Four key facts support my assessment. First, COVID emerged in Wuhan, 
a city that is 800 miles from the closest bats harboring SARS-CoV-2 like viruses that could have served as progenitors of SARS-CoV-2, but that contains lab that prior to the outbreak were conducting the world's largest research program on bat SARS viruses, possessed the world's largest collection of bat SARS viruses, and possessed the virus most closely similar to SARS-CoV-2. The large distance between Wuhan and bats harboring SARS-CoV-2-like viruses points away from a natural origin of COVID, and Wuhan's status as the global epicenter of research on bat SARS viruses points toward a research origin of COVID. Second, in the four years preceding the outbreak, Wuhan labs performed research that placed them on a trajectory to obtain SARS viruses having high pandemic potential. And in 2018, one year before the outbreak, Wuhan labs proposed research to obtain SARS viruses having even higher pandemic potential and features that match in detail the features of SARS-CoV-2. Wuhan labs performed high-risk virus discovery and gain-of-function research on bat SARS viruses. In their virus discovery research, Wuhan researchers searched for new bat viruses in caves in southern China, brought samples to Wuhan, and sequenced cultured and characterized new viruses in Wuhan. In their gain-of-function research, Wuhan researchers genetically modified bat SARS viruses, constructing viruses having enhanced ability to infect human cells and having enhanced viral growth and enhanced lethality in mice engineered to possess human receptors for SARS viruses, so-called humanized mice. Already in 2015, scientists expressed concern that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was conducting research that posed unacceptably high risk. At a 2015 Royal Society and National Academies meeting on gain-of-function research and its oversight, the research on bat SARS viruses by the Wuhan Institute of Virology and its collaborators was singled out as the research most likely of all research in the world to trigger a pandemic. In 2017 to 2018, with NIH funding, the Wuhan Institute of Virology constructed genetically modified SARS viruses that combined the spike gene from one bat SARS virus with the rest of the genetic information from another bat SARS virus. Obtaining new viruses that efficiently infected human cells and obtaining at least one new virus that exhibited 10,000 times enhanced viral growth in lungs and one million times enhanced viral growth in brains and three times enhanced lethality in humanized mice. In 2018, just one year before the outbreak, in an NIH grant proposal, the Wuhan Institute of Virology and collaborators proposed to construct additional genetically modified SARS viruses, proposing to construct viruses having spikes with even higher binding affinities for human SARS receptors, seeking viruses having even higher pandemic potential. Also in 2018, just one year before the outbreak, in a DARPA grant proposal, the Wuhan Institute of Virology and its collaborators proposed to construct genetically modified SARS viruses having a furin cleavage site a feature associated with increased viral growth and increased transmissibility. They proposed to insert the furin cleavage site at the spike gene S1, S2 border and to construct the viruses by synthesizing six nucleic acid building blocks and assembling them using the reagent BSM-B1. Third, Wuhan labs performed this research on SARS viruses using an inadequate biosafety standard just biosafety level two, and inadequate personal protective equipment, just gloves and a lab coat. Lab accidents that result in infection or release are common, even at biosafety levels higher than biosafety level two. For context, the original SARS virus, SARS-CoV-1, caused lab-acquired infections in Singapore at biosafety level three, in Beijing twice at biosafety level three, and in Taipei at biosafety level four. For further context, SARS-CoV-2 itself caused lab-acquired infections in Beijing in 2020 at biosafety level three, and in Taipei in 2021 at biosafety level three. The Wuhan lab's use of biosafety level two for research on bat SARS viruses would have posed a high risk, a very high risk, of infection of lab staff upon encountering a virus having the aerosol transmission properties of SARS-CoV-2. Fourth, in 2019, a novel SARS virus having a spike with extremely high binding affinity for human SARS receptors, a furin cleavage site inserted at the spike S1-S2 border, 
and a genome sequence with features enabling assembly from six synthetic nucleic acid building blocks using the reagent BSMB1, a virus having the exact features proposed in the 2018 NIH and DARPA proposals emerged on the doorstep of Wuhan Institute of Virology. SARS-CoV-2 is the only one of more than 800 known SARS viruses that possesses a furin cleavage site. Mathematically, this observation alone implies that the probability of finding a natural SARS virus possessing a furin cleavage site is less than one in 800. Taken together, the presence of a spike having an extremely high affinity for human SARS receptors, the presence of a furin cleavage site inserted at the spike S1, S2 border, the genome sequence enabling assembly from six synthetic nucleic acid building blocks using the reagent BSMB1, and the 141 match between these features and the features proposed in the 2018 NIH and DARPA proposals make an extremely strong case, a smoking gun, for a research origin. In summary, multiple lines of secure evidence point to a research origin. By contrast, as I hope I will have the opportunity to review in response to questions, no, zero secure evidence points toward a natural origin. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to, to each of our witnesses. Uh, Dr. Gary, my first question is gonna, I'm gonna direct it towards uh, you. Uh, of the, uh, the evidence that's been presented uh, so thus far, it, it's still not clear to me how much is concrete, documented information, and how much uh, is uh, speculation, uh, or perhaps just filling uh, in the gaps with assumptions uh, based on what's, what's out there. So my question for you, Dr. Gary, is could you elaborate more on the specific hard evidence that supports your claim that the Chinese market in Wuhan was the most likely source of the virus? Certainly, and thank you for the question. Um, there is a lot of evidence that this virus emerged from the um, Hanan seafood market in Wuhan, but let me just focus on three points. Uh, epidemiology, molecular forensics, and genetics. First, the epidemiology. The early cases from December 2019, before the disease was even described, all centered around, in fact, they painted a bullseye on the Hanan seafood market. The molecular forensics. Environmental samples were collected from the market after it was closed. The hotspot of SARS-CoV-2 positivity, the RNA, was in the southwest corner of the market. In those very same samples, RNA and DNA, from raccoon dogs and mass palm civets was found in these samples, commingling with the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Genetics. The SARS-CoV-2 spilled over at least twice in the market. The phylogenetics, the genetics of the virus are very clear about that. That is not compatible with a lab leak. Dr. Gary, uh, do we know that the virus that caused COVID-19 existed in the Wuhan lab? Uh, before the pandemic, and if not, how, how could we find that out? In fact, we don't know. Um, the intelligence community has looked at that point very um, intently and has not been able to determine that uh, Wuhan had the virus. Um, uh, we don't have the evidence from the Chinese. It's just one of the many things that we're missing that, that we would like to get from, from the Chinese government. Based on uh, uh, the bat corona, uh, coronavirus that we, uh, we know that uh, researchers in the Wuhan lab are working on, would, would it have been possible for them to create this virus? Is it possible? Not from a bat coronavirus. Uh, if you take the time to read my written testimony, I'm going to, uh, in that document, I went through a lot of evidence that this virus did not spill over directly from a bat to a human being. Um, there, it had to go through an intermediate animal. And it's not just the, the evidence from the non-market. There's other uh, genetic evidence. The, the bat coronaviruses are viruses that are spread by the gastro, gastrointestinal route. Uh, for a, a virus like this to become a respiratory virus, it's just gonna require too many mutations, too many changes uh, for a bat virus to spill directly over to a human being. That could only really happen in nature uh, with replication through an intermediate animal. Very good. Dr. Koblitz, uh, the next question is uh, for you. Uh, I'm aware that uh, through FOIA requests, a lot of information from U.S. agencies and U.S.-based organizations 
have been obtained by uh, people uh, investigating the COVID-19 origins. However, it seems as though we've gotten uh, relatively little or, or nothing uh, from Chinese agencies or the Wuhan Institute uh, of Virology specifically. So my question for you, sir, is what specific information from China would be most helpful in settling uh, this origin debate? Um, th thank you, Senator. Um, th there's a range of information that would be useful for uh, furthering our um, investigation of the origins of, of the pandemic. Um, the uh, Chinese government has collected lots of information about the, um, uh, uh, the samples that were both at Hunan Market and, and elsewhere in Wuhan uh, and in other provinces where they sampled um, animals, um, but they haven't released the raw data. They've provided information, but not the data that epidemiologists and virologists have wanted to see in order to do their own uh, analyses. Um, just last year, they did release uh, more information uh, through publications, but this is information they've been sitting on for quite a while. So there is more information that uh, should be released and should be made the raw data available to independent outside experts to make their own um, assessments. Um, in terms of um, the one Institute of Virology, um, there should be records about the research they're conducting. There should be records about the medical surveillance they're performing on their researchers, um, records on the um, maintenance and operation of their biocontainment equipment, um, and all that, uh, those documentations um, would be, um, uh, uh, could be reviewed by outside experts to determine um, if there's any signs that there was any um, uh, accidents or any uh, indications that there was, um, you know, the, the virus was, um, uh, you know, made an escape of, from the lab. So th there's quite a bit of information that, that's available, um, but obviously the Chinese government has chosen to be um, opaque about uh, what they have and what they know uh, in a way that has frustrated um, uh, people involved with looking at this in terms of assessing both the um, natural zoonotic spillover um, pathway and also looking at the, the lab accident pathway. Dr. Gary, uh, you talked about uh, the virus jumping uh, from, a, from an animal uh, into a human, and we've heard uh, the term spillover. Uh, for, the, for the benefit of this committee, uh, could you explain uh, spillover? human diseases have come to us from animals. Um, when we're talking about a spillover, we're talking about a cross-species transmission from one animal species uh, to another. I mean, it could be another animal, but you know, usually when we talk about spillover, we're talking about from an animal to a human. So animals have their own viruses, just like we do. Um, the ones that are dangerous in the animals, though, are the ones that, that have the, the capacity to infect more than one species. You can think about a virus like rabies that can infect you know, a, a wide range of mammalian host. So do we know what uh, animal or animals could have carried uh, this uh, virus, and were they at the, uh, at the market? If I explain uh, that more fully, please. Sure. Uh, we don't know that for sure. Uh, what we do know is, is that uh, when you look for the virus in the market on environmental surfaces in um, various places, you found it mostly in the southwest corner of the market. This is where the wildlife was sold, um, the animals like the raccoon donks or the mass palm civets. And in fact, there were many of the samples there had SARS-CoV-2 and uh, DNA and RNA from those animals right there in the same sample. There's, there's, you could imagine somebody maybe came and you know sneezed on that sample, but the, the most likely explanation is, is that animals were in fact infected themselves with SARS-CoV-2. When you look at the drains outside of that one stall that had the most SARS-CoV-2, uh, that drain also had uh, had virus. So it's um, you know we don't have the smoking gun evidence that, you know, there was actually an infected animal in the market, but I think we have the next best thing with this uh, forensic molecular biology. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Ranking Member Paul, you're recognized for your questions. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit statements for the record from U.S. Right to Know, Open the Books, America First Legal, Frontiers of Freedom, and Dr. Alina Chan. Without objection. So just in the last few minutes, Dr. Gary has told us that this couldn't have come from bats. It had to go through an intermediate host. That may well be true, but arguing against that is they tested 90,000 some odd animals and there is no animal host that's been found. 
But what he also doesn't tell you is the animal host could be a, a laboratory animal. It could be passed serially through that, and that's one way of quickly adapting and pushing natural selection to adapt a virus towards humans. Dr. Alina Chan has written extensively about this, how this virus didn't show up clunky and poorly transmissible. This virus showed up immediately very transmissible in humans as if it had been pre-adapted in a lab. Dr. E. Bright. Dr. Gary tells us that he's wedded to the scientific method and that uh, he considered all the different possibilities in proximal origins. And I know you're a professor, and I'm assuming you've been the senior author on many papers. I assume that you teach your younger uh, researchers what is good scientific method and not good scientific method. In the abstract of proximal origins, Dr. Gary and his fellow authors state categorically that the virus is not a laboratory construct. That doesn't sound to me like open-mindedness, and I wonder what you would tell a younger researcher or someone you were instructing in the scientific method about putting uh, categorical statements into a scientific paper. Well, it's important to emphasize that the paper in question, Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2, published in March 2020, was not a research article. It was an opinion piece. It was published as a commentary, which is the section in the journal that holds opinion pieces and editorials. So it was an opinion piece. The authors were stating their opinion. But that opinion was not well-founded. In March of 2020, there was no basis to state that as a conclusion as opposed to simply being a hypothesis. Moreover, we know we know that compelling evidence has been presented as a result of congressional inquiry in the House that four of the authors of that paper, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Gary, Dr. Holmes, and Dr. Rambeau, in their private communications show clearly that they knew the conclusion that they stated in that article was invalid. So in terms of what I would tell a younger scientist I would be mentoring, I would tell a younger scientist that you do not state a conclusion without evidence, even in an opinion piece in a scientific journal. And you never, under any circumstances in a scientific journal, state conclusions that you know to be unsound. That represents scientific misconduct. It represents scientific misconduct up to and including fraud. And the paper in question, the Proximal Origin paper, has been recommended for review of retraction. Two requests, one in 2023 and one in 2024, were submitted by teams of scientists to the journal in question, to the journal editors, asking them to add an editorial expression of concern and to initiate a review for retraction of the article. I know of no other example in modern scientific history or publications where a publication has come forward pronouncing with such authority that the lab leak is implausible, it is not a laboratory construct, while privately saying, this is no friggin' con conspiracy theory, looks like it did, I'm 90-10, I'm 50-50 but no doubt in the paper. In fact, we know that it went back and forth with Dr. Fauci and with editors who say, we want the statements to be stronger. We want the conclusions to be stronger. That was actually coming from nature at the time. We want you to doctor it up and even be more strong because we're making a political point here. That's where we should have known we were off track, that these people were politicians and that they were pushing an idea because as Dr. Collins finally admitted in one of the emails, this is about the business of science with China. This will disturb our relations with China if anybody questions this. Dr. Quay, the idea that this came from the fish market, I thought had been discredited by virtually all of scientists. Now, I'm really surprised it's still being presented here. I know that uh, the Chinese, uh, the CDC, George Gao over there, uh, basically said that they no longer consider it. And actually, if you think about it from their perspective, we're not sure if we can trust them. But at the same time, the Chinese, if they would rather have it come from a lab or the market, I think would choose the market over the lab. If anything, they would be, if we were going to think they were dishonest, would be dishonest towards saying, hey, we found some animals. But I, I, if you could review stepwise just a little bit slower some of the evidence for why it's not there, the amount of animals tested, the animal handlers compared to SARS-1, but also the idea of this uh, genetic diversity that... Uh, 
you know, when SARS-1 came about the first time, I think it tried hundreds of times because these animal viruses don't infect humans well in the beginning. It tried a hundred times over and over again. And even in the end, SARS-1 didn't transmit between humans very well. That's why containment worked. And that's why quarantine worked because it wasn't very infectious. But go through a little bit step by step the evidence of why anybody still maintaining that it came from the market is, is misguided. Sure. I mean, let me, let me agree with Dr. Gary about SARS-1 being a spillover, and let me elaborate a little bit. There were 11 cities, 11 markets, three different lineages, and a 30 nucleotide difference among the initial cases and patients, which approximates about a year of posterior diversity, as it's called. SARS-2, of course, there's, there's, it's either in one market or it's in no markets. There's no other pro proposal for a, for a market origin from it. 457 animals were tested in the market. Zero were found to be infected. SARS-1, 92 animals, 100% infected. The, 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 uh, the vendors, the wildlife vendors in SARS-1 were all infected. We have 10 vendors here. None of them are infected. One vendor had bamboo rats from, from uh, southern China where the backbone comes from. He, was, he wasn't infected. His animals weren't infected. Uh, SARS-2 has no posterior diversity. So it really, as, as Dr. Anderson said, it's one jump from one animal to one human. The most likely place that happens is in a laboratory. And again, to be clear, when you say an animal, it could be, it could be a Petri dish. It could be animal cells in a Petri dish. The, the question of where the origins came from is the question of where the animal is. And they've tested 96 animals in nature, and they've tested zero animals at Wuhan Institute of Virology. That's where we need to look. Thank you. I'll reserve the rest for a second round. Senator Hassan, you're recognized for your questions. Well, thanks, Chair Peters and Ranking Member Paul for holding this hearing. Thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. Um, Dr. Koblenz, one of the areas of inquiry in this hearing is obviously whether research funded by the United States government has appropriate oversight. However, private companies, universities, and independent research institutions are also engaging in cutting edge research. While their research has the potential to cure diseases and boost our economy, unless they accept federal funding, there is very little federal oversight to ensure that private labs are engaged in safe and ethical research. What safety procedures are in place for research facilities that don't receive government funding? And are there oversight measures that either government or independent authorities should put in place to monitor work at these labs, including labs working on gene synthesis? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, the, uh, the oversight of privately funded research is much less than that of federally funded research in terms of both biosafety, biosecurity, and do this research oversight. Um, what we've seen in um, the area of dual-use research oversight, for example, in the most recent um, policy that the Biden administration released uh, only applies to federally funded research. Um, however, there is the ability for federal agencies to require their, their grant recipients to apply this new policy to all research, including that's privately funded, uh, but that requires special authority that some agencies may have, but others would need um, legislation to give them that, that ability. That wouldn't cover research that's only conducted by privately funded entities, but it would expand the scope of, of, of research that, that is. Uh, in order to expand the scope of, of oversight to all privately funded research would require um, a legislative action. Um, and um, along the lines of the, the proposal I included in my written statement for the establishment of a national bio-risk management agency, that would have authority over um, biosafety, biosecurity, and dual-use research oversight, regardless of source of funding. Okay. Because at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter where the funding comes from in terms of making sure this research is being done safely, securely, and responsibly. Thank you for that. Um, another question to you, Dr. Koblenz. We've heard a great deal about the risks of certain types of research involving dangerous pathogens and the need for robust oversight on the type of experiments that are performed. We've heard less about the potential risks for, from researchers performing off the books or unsupervised experiments that may be risky or unethical. How serious are the risks posed by malicious or unethical insiders, and are the United States and international authorities equipped to sufficiently mitigate these risks? Um, so um, following the, the revelations that Bruce Ivins was responsible for the anthrax letter tax, um, which happened in, in 2009, um, the United States took a much uh, stronger stance on uh, trying to prevent insider threats at, at facilities. And so the Federal Select Agent Program which focus on biosecurity, 
uh, included a number of measures to try and better monitor scientific access to, to pathogens in terms of ensuring that they remain, um, uh, they, they do not become security risks. Right. Um, that kind of um, uh, efforts to mitigate insider threats does not exist in, in the side of the Julius Research Oversight. Um, there is a lot of um, emphasis on self-governance by research institutions and by PIs to basically govern their own labs and make sure that work is not being done that is, um, as you said, off the books or, or is in any way uh, unethical. But so it is really at this point on the onus is on research institutions to make sure that the work activity being done on their facilities is in compliance with all relevant um, laws and regulations. So that is an area that um, is currently a, a gap in our oversight of this kind of research. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question for you. When it comes to biosecurity, the U.S. domestic security is obviously tied to international efforts. What happens halfway across the globe can clearly impact us in the United States. Doctor, you're involved in the Global Biolabs Initiative, which is an organization that tracks all the highest biosecurity level labs in the world. Are there labs that are of particular concern? And if so, what action should Congress and the executive branch take to improve their safety and thus our national security? Um, as we documented in our report last year on um, Global Biolabs, um, there's been a building boom in BSL-4 um, labs since the start of the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of countries that are now building their first BSL-4 labs um, that don't actually have their national biosafety and biosecurity legislation regulations in place. And so countries like uh, the Philippines, uh, Kazakhstan, um, uh, Saudi Arabia um, are trying to um, construct facilities, but they don't yet have the regulatory infrastructure that they need to make sure those labs can be operated safely, securely, and responsibly. Uh, in addition, um, countries like China and India, who already operate BSO-4 labs, right. are planning on building additional labs uh, as well. Um, and so in, in all of these cases, uh, there's a need for uh, making sure that these, you know, at the national level, that the right um, virus management policies are in place, and then at the laboratory level, that these um, uh, policies are being followed properly. Uh, and there are a number of, of measures that the, both the U.S. and internationally through WHO and other entities could take to try and uh, ensure that these uh, regulations are um, in place and are being followed properly. And, and can you elaborate on what those steps would be? Sure. So um, there is a, um, uh, a, a uh, international standard for bio-risk management um, that um, uh, creates a, a framework for how do you ensure that safety and security is prioritized across your laboratory and your research enterprise. It's called ISO 35001. Mm -hmm. um, it was negotiated end of 2019, but has not been widely adopted yet. Um, by labs around the world. Having that kind of uh, international standard is very useful because it provides the best practices for biosafety and biosecurity, and it includes a, um, a process by which you need to document how you're complying with that standard. That documentation then becomes available for audit in the event that you need, you need to have any kind of investigation um, by local, national, and national authorities to, to ensure that the facility is operating properly and is, is operating safely and, and securely. So that kind of standard provides an, an international um, metric for measuring whether or not a, a lab is, is operating to the international standards that we, we would hope they would be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Johnson. You're recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for holding this uh, very important hearing. Uh, we need a lot more of these. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses for your very detailed testimony. And I'd encourage anybody viewing this uh, hearing to go online and, and read the detailed testimony. I think you find it very difficult to not come away after reading that, that you know, we may not have a smoking gun, but the circumstantial evidence is strong that this was a man-made virus and that it was probably leaked from a lab, probably at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, you know, one thing that's convinced me very early on, I've been convinced of this quite some time, is just the cover-up. I mean, the fact the Chinese took down data sets. So all of a sudden, you, you couldn't find a smoking gun because it no longer exists, and we'll probably never uh, know that. But also the cover-up here within the U.S. government. I've been doing uh, oversight on our response to COVID, which, by the way, was a miserable failure. We're 4% of the world's population. We apparently experienced 16% of the deaths, which supposedly the most modern med you know, medical system in the world. That's a miserable failure. And so we need to do a lot of oversight, not just on the origin, which is an important aspect of this, but on everything, okay? Um, 
If we're serious about this, by the way, we, sh we have to start letting subpoenas start flying. I I'll do this one more time. I've done this multiple times. This is the 50 final pages of Fauci's emails. By the way, the, the only reason we realize that Fauci was engaged in a, a cover-up with Dr. Gary is the fact that we had to FOIA these. They didn't turn these over, which they should have. We had to FOIA them. We had to go to court. Uh, our staff has taken the 4,000 pages that we got that were redacted, narrowed those down to 400 pages, and they allowed us to look at these things unredacted in a reading room. 350 pages, but not the final 50. In terms of the cover-up, my guess is the smoking gun exists somewhere under these heavy redactions. So my, my suggestion, actually my, my uh, plea to the chairman is to issue a subpoena to get these final 50 pages, then maybe we'll get a full extent of, of the extensive cover-up. Uh, Dr. Gary, I don't know, have you ever used the word conspiracy theory as it relates to the lab leak? Have you ever accused people who put that thing forward, they're a bunch of conspiracy theorists? Not in, not in my public. Okay, well, I'll tell you who, I'll tell you who has, <laughs> is the chief editor-in-chief of Nature ma Magazine that published The Proximal Origin. He said, talking about your study, your cover-up, great work. We'll put conspiracy theories about the origin of SARS-CoV-2 to rest. Will you at least admit that people who are raising the possibility of a lab leak we're not conspiracy theorists, that there were legitimate concern about gain-of-function research creating this chimeric virus. Of course, sir. I mean, that would include Good. us at the very that's, beginning. That's, that's, <laughs> prog that's progress because, again, an awful lot, awful lot of people's reputations were ruined by this cover-up and by the accusations of people being a conspiracy theorists. Now, Dr. Ebright, you know, the, the purpose of this hearing really is to talk about the danger of gain-of-function research. You know, right now we're, we're about ready to be scaremongered. I think we're already being scaremongered on H5N1. Uh, back in 2000, late 2011, the world learned of two scientific teams, one in University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, one in the Netherlands, uh, that had apparently said each of these labs create H5N1 viruses that had gained the ability to spread through the air between ferrets. The animal model used to study how flu viruses might behave in, in humans. That's pretty darn dangerous stuff, right? That is primarily what led to the moratorium on gain and function, correct? That is correct. What possible reason is there to be producing what nature probably couldn't produce? Why are we doing this? It's important to emphasize that the research in question has no zero civilian practical applications. Gain-of-function research on potential pandemic pathogens is not used and does not contribute to the development of vaccines and is not used and for and does not contribute to the development of drugs. So, so, so again, the, the, that rationale for all this research is exactly that. In, in, in case we but have to respond, not. in case, but that's the rationale, in case we have to respond to a bioweapon attack, okay? Uh, we need a defense mechanism. So that, that's, that's the reason, for example, the Defense Department has spent $42 million or funded Eco Health Alliance for $42 million and USAID for $53 million, correct? So the current definition is research that is reasonably anticipated to increase either the transmissibility or the virulence of a potential pandemic pathogen. That research does not contribute to developing countermeasures against Potential but again, that's, that's the rationale they used. You know, the, the thing they really scared the public on was the 1918 flu pandemic, correct? Uh, even Anthony Fauci has admitted most people who died of the flu pandemic died of pneumonia because we didn't have antibiotics, correct? Bacterial again, I, pneumonia. I, I think one of the things we have to provide oversight is the sabotage of early treatment using widely available cheap and safe generic drugs. We didn't do that. I mean, from my standpoint, the first thing we ought to be doing in any kind of pandemic is, is there some way to treat this and let doctors be doctors, let them practice medicine. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the concept of Miller's Ratchet, correct? Of what? Miller's Ratchet. Okay, well, it's, it, it's, it's basically what viruses generally do is they'll become more transmissible, but less pathogenic. 
Okay, because again, it, it doesn't do, a virus snuffs itself out. MERS snuffed itself out. SARS snuffed itself out, except there were a couple lab leaks that produced SARS outbreaks, correct? So again, my point is, are we making things worse with human intervention? Producing vaccines that are, that are not sterilizing, that allow variants to be produced, and things like antibody-dependent enhancement. Again, there's an awful lot of concern that we don't even consider here because we're on this quest to have a vaccine for everything and produce vaccines for uh, viruses that haven't even been created yet in a lab. Again, that's the question we ought to be asking this committee is, what in the world are we doing? What's the rationale for doing this? And are we actually causing more harm than good? With vaccine development, I would disagree. The vaccines, vaccines in general, do not pose significant harms and offer significant benefits. With respect to the gain of function research, which creates new threats, biological threats that do not exist currently and might not naturally come into existence in a decade, a century, or a millennium, that research creates threats. And those threats are existentially risky threats and that research is being conducted without a justifiable rationale. There is no rationale in terms of development of countermeasures. Industry develops vaccines and therapeutics against diseases currently in humans, not against diseases that don't yet exist and need to be made in a lab. We could use a public debate regarding all things vaccine, the profit motive of it and everything else, but that's for another day. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Marshall, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's first of all, it's important to remember why we're here today. We're here today because we don't want to have another pandemic like this. I think it's important that we recognize that a million Americans have lost a loved one and they're still looking for closure. We have 15 million Americans with long COVID. And perhaps if we knew the origin of COVID and the development, maybe that would give us a clue how to treat us. Um, I want to start with Dr. Quay and go back to the diffuse grant for just a second. Uh, this is a grant by EcoHealth and Peter Daszak. Recall that Peter Daszak is David Moran's BFF. Um, and that grant was denied, but yet it lays out a framework for the development of, of COVID-19. And you went through six or seven several reasons that are absolutely consistent that they said they would do x and they did x and what are the chances of all those things ending up in a covid virus yeah well again just as a reminder so they they said they were going to go to a particular spot in southern china uh, to get a virus they were going to make sure that it had diversity from sars-1 of about 25 percent they were going to put it into uh, humanized mice to enhance its ability to recognize the receptor binding domain they're going to put fear and cleavage site in a very particular spot you know out of 13,000 letters in the spike protein they said in the grant they were going to put it at a spot called the s1 s2 junction they uh, they they said uh, and so all of those were found in SARS-CoV-2. Its nearest neighbor is from the same area. It's, it has a 99% binding affinity for the, for the human receptor. SARS-1 jumped into humans. It only had 15% of the epidemic changes it needed to what, become epidemic. What do you think the chances of all six well, or seven years? I've quantified it because I like statistics, and it's one in 1.2 billion. So a one in a billion chance all that comes to fruition. There were some comments on that grant in the margin. So Dr. Barrick, North Carolina, developed the technology for the, the protein spike. He taught Dr. Xi. He gave them humanized mice. Again, this was all funded with USAID grant, grant money as well. What were some of the comments in the margin you think that are significant? Well, this is important because the, 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 po the folks told DARPA, we're going to do this research in North Carolina under very high safety conditions in the grant. That's what they wrote. The marginal comments in drafts that were only obtained through FOIAs said a different thing. Dasik said, hey, we're going we're gonna to shift this over to Wuhan because it'll be cheaper, faster. Uh, we'll get a lot more done that way. Barrick says, boy, if U.S. scientists knew this was going on, they would think this is crazy. This is in the marginal comments. So they, in a way, they weren't truthful with DARPA in the so, grant. So Dr. Barrick, you, you know, along with Dr. Fauci, the father of gain of function, knew that, that other scientists in America 
would have a fit if this was being done here. Yeah, and again, so fast forward to January 2020. These two science, scientists, Dasik and, and Barrick, sitting down with a sequence of SARS-CoV-2 and a computer would know within one hour, this thing has all the features of what we proposed in that grant. And the fact they either didn't tell anybody or the people they told didn't do anything about it, meant that they, that human to human transmission was not a, we were not aware of that and asymptomatic transmission we were not aware of this is the first new respiratory virus that's asymptomatic great Those let's, two let's come back i'm going to use that uh, come back to that point in ju in just a second you know we went through what i call the smoking guns that really show beyond a reasonable doubt that this virus was made in a, a laboratory in wuhan china it was synthetic uh, you know everywhere from the geography of where it shows up for the first time to uh, the, the fact that there was virus already spread to multiple continents by the time the wet market brought break uh, occurs. They never have found the intermediate species. With SARS and MERS, it took months to find an intermediate species. Anyone that says the raccoon dog is the intermediate species is just laughable science. Uh, no progenitor viruses. Um, and the timeline, they were developing a vaccine already in November 2019. Dr. Shi has taken down the DNA lab banks in September 2019. She takes down another uh, the lab bank here in this country, maybe March of the next year as well. But of all the smoking guns, and this is the hardest to explain to people, is, is just the, the genetic makeup of this virus. And you pointed out the protein spike. The protein spike alone would be like a person. That the protein spike that fits into a lung cell would be like the chances of a person walking in the room with a key that fits the lock on those doors. I mean, it was a perfect protein spike. You mentioned the furin cleavage site. Uh, there's other spots. But I want to talk about the ORF8 site for just a second. Uh, Dr. Quay, what's the significance of this ORF8 site? So ORF8 is a protein that's down near the right-hand side of the, of the virus. Uh, it is not in the final virus. It is secreted into the bloodstream, and it does two things. Uh, early in the infection, it, it blocks interferon expression, so you don't, you don't sweat, you don't have a fever, you don't show the symptoms of an infection. And later in the infection, it blocks what's called uh, antigen MHC presentation. So we learn from HIV that a virus that can block the ability of pieces of the virus to be presented to the immune system is a virus that is very hard to make antibodies against, very hard to fight against it. Uh, two master's theses uh, during 2015 that have only been published in Chinese, no paper came from it at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, created a synthetic cloning system for ORF8. Right. So gain of function research around things that make viruses asymptomatic and things that, that make them not be able to make antibodies to are, are beyond the pale of what, what uh, you know, Dr. Ebright has said in terms of the civilian use. So There's could, Dr. Quay, no so, civilian so use. So really this ORF8 is a synthetic link sequence never found in nature, and they place it in here right? They place this link in here for the purposes of the two cardinal sins, the cardinal sin of asymptomatic uh, virus and then transmission with, without that symptom as well, and the inability to make an immune response. I mean, that's the cardinal sins of gain-of-function research. What, what purpose would there be to, if you're wanting to develop vaccines? Is there any civilian purpose or is this, a, in fact, a bioweapon? I can't say it's a bioweapon because that's in the mind of the person that made it, but, but it is, it is a highly unusual, highly synthetic. They were doing synthetic biology around it, and its two functions are quite remarkable with respect to uh, what kind of research you would do in the civilian world. Dr. Ebert, is there a possibility that it could have been a dual purpose, that it could have been used as a bioweapon? So the original SARS virus, SARS-CoV-1, yeah. is a tier one select agent in the United States. So it is in the group of pathogens and biological toxins that our federal government has identified as having high potential for use as a bioweapon in biowarfare, bioterrorism, or biocrime. It by definition, therefore, according to our federal government, is a bioweapon agent. It is not a bioweapon but it is an agent that potentially could be used. Is there any good use, any good reason to put this in the, vi in the virus if you're developing a vaccine? I would re return to my general comment on gain of function research on potential pandemic pathogens. It, the research has no civilian practical application. Researchers undertake it because it is fast, it is easy, it requires no specialized equipment or skills, 
and it was prioritized for funding and has been prioritized for publication by scientific journals. These are major incentives to researchers worldwide, in China and in the US. The researchers undertake this research because it's easy, they get the money, and they can get the papers. Here's Senator Marshall. Senator Scott, you're recognized for your questions. First, I want to thank the chair and the ranking member for hosting this hearing. Um, we should did this a lot. I think we, there's a lot that we still need to learn. The COVID pandemic was devastating for our country, as we all know. The response by the Biden administration and the media has done nothing but amplify the consequences of this crisis and erode trust in our federal government. Not long ago, anyone asking questions about the origins of COVID and the possibility of this virus resulting from a lab leak were branded as conspiracy theorists. Just like the Hunter Biden laptop story, the experts said this was disinformation and waged a campaign against members of Congress medical professionals and everyone else asking questions to discredit them as liar and extremist. Anthony Fauci led the charge in this public smear campaign, and I think it's great that he's not there anymore. We know that this is, that, that this is not only a credible theory, but the most likely cause of the pandemic. Common China can't be trusted, and because the Biden administration has chosen weak appeasement of the CCP, we still haven't forced accountability or got the answers the American public deserve. HSS Office of the Inspector General did a review of the EcoHealth Alliance and its management of the grant contract. EcoHealth received funds and had the Wuhan Institute as a subcontractor. It's my understanding that NIH requires annual data reporting for what we spend money on and the research data. The Wuhan Institute never, never provided or only provided partial data. EcoHealth either failed to submit or submitted incomplete data. NIH failed to police their own grant program and allowed this to slide for years. About 85% of EcoHealth's budget comes from federal research grants. I, I have no idea why NIH would think it's a good idea to give U.S. tax dollars to Communist China. Seems like a pretty poor idea to me. Dr. Ebert, Ebright, would it make sense to hold grant recipients accountable for the failure to comply with the terms of their grants? Why not require the prime grantee to fully reimburse the government if they or one of their subcontractees fail to fully comply with the terms of the grant? Seems like we do that with our, pers our personal life. If somebody does the wrong thing, they owe us the money back. So what do you think? We do currently hold the grantee responsible, not only for the primary award, but for subawards, for subcontracts. When a researcher submits a grant proposal to NIH, when a researcher submits each annual grant progress report to NIH, the researcher signs a certification box. And that certification box says that the researcher will comply with the terms and condition of the grant and will provide full and factual information upon request subject to administrative, civil, and criminal penalties. So the basis for accountability exists. Has EcoHealth been held accountable? Have they given us any money back? Uh, to my knowledge, there has been no clawback of funding from EcoHealth. There has, however, been an immediate suspension that went into effect uh, a month ago, both of EcoHealth Alliance and then this month of its president, a suspension of eligibility for federal funding of all forms and a referral uh, for debarment from eligibility for federal funding from all sources. Have you, do you know any instances where NIH has ever held anybody accountable and gotten the money back? Yes, so this has happened in a number of cases. Examples include data fraud. Other examples include sexual harassment or other forms of abuse that are outside the terms and conditions of the grant. So why do you think they haven't gotten the money back from EcoHealth? Why haven't they been held accountable? I would place that burden on Congress and on the White House in that the NIH is unlikely to move toward clawback without motivation from either Congress or the White but House. But it's their job. It is their job, but it is also the job of our legislative branch through its oversight responsibility and our executive branch through its primary responsibility to ensure that jobs are carried out. Do you know anybody at NIH that's ever been fired for failure to do, do their job? You mean an NIH staffer? Oh, yeah. As part of the administrative staff at NIH. You, have you heard of anybody? I do not. Has anybody you know of ever been fired from NIH over what they did with, by not uh, enforcing um, the EcoHealth 
uh, grant program? Not to my knowledge. Yep. So as you said, EcoHealth has been suspended by further funding with possible disbarment, but they're currently appealing. Do you think it's right to debar them? Absolutely. So when you so how long should they be debarred for? The debarment term specified by law typically is three years. The debarment proceedings determine first whether a debarment will occur and then determine the duration, the term of the debarment. I would recommend a permanent debarment given the number of terms and conditions of the EcoHealth Alliance grants that were violated and the severity of those violations. So Wuhan Institute of Viro for Virology has been debarred for 10 years. Do you think it be, should be permanent? And why hasn't it been? Yes, I do. I so do not know why. Why do you, why do you think it ha wasn't permanent? Uh, I do not know. Okay. So does anybody else have any any background of why NIH doesn't enforce their own? I mean, it's their, it's, it's, it's their own rules. Have you guys, have you heard of people, anybody from NIH being, being, dis, being reprimanded, fired, or anything over the EcoHealth? No. Why do you all think? I, I think the retired uh, head of the NIAID should be asked that question. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Scott. Senator Romney, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ranking member for the hearing. Um, I'd like to get a sense of um, there's a lot of energy and passion around was it at, from an animal or was it a lab leak? Uh, and, and I must admit, I don't understand why there's so much energy around that. It strikes me that we'll never be 100% sure, I presume, about one or the other. We might be 98% or something, but we'll always be a little uncertain. And given the fact that it could have been either, we know what action we ought to take to protect from either. And, and so why there's so much passion around it makes me think it's more political than scientific, but maybe I'm wrong. So the action, it strikes me that based on what I've heard, we shouldn't be fi financing gain of function research. What I heard was there's no particular reason for it uh, other than uh, uh, military warfare. We shouldn't do that anyway. So one, we know that. Uh, whether it came from an animal or not, we shouldn't be f financing gain of function research. Number two, we should insist that any place we send money follows the international ISO standards. I, I didn't get the number, uh, Dr. Kovalex, but I, I, uh, you had a uh, number there that suggested that people uh, have to follow. So we shouldn't be getting money or going to labs that don't follow those international standards. And number three, uh, whether it was from a wet market or the Wuhan lab, China's to blame. Uh, both those things were in China. And, uh, and so if we're looking for someone to blame, we know who it is. It's the Chinese, and they should take responsibility for it and should have opened themselves up to complete uh, disclosure. Um, so am, am I wrong here? Is there a, a reason there's so much energy around whether it came from uh, a, w a wet market or a lab? In both cases, the action is simple. We should clean up the wet labs, and number two, we should tighten Excuse me, the wet markets, and number two, we should tighten the labs. What, uh, uh, please, go ahead, uh, Dr. Quay. Uh, I, I, oh, well, I'll just say briefly, I mean, I think, I think the energy is around the fact that paychecks, salaries, careers are based on continuing uh, gain-of-function research by some of the most vocal people uh, in, this, in this debate. And I think if you follow the money, you'll see the answer. Thank you. Dr. Gary, what's your thought? Well, I, you know, a lot of the talk around gain and function research depends on how you, just, how you define it. And the definition is very important. I mean, there's some informal definitions. There are very technical de definitions. I mean, we have to get that part right. Because if you define it in a way that basically interferes with uh, a lot of biomedical research on viruses and on other things too, cancer research, everything, um, you're going to really cripple the biomedical research enterprise. So let's get that right. Um, I don't think, you know, just blanket we should stop funding all gain of function research because some of that is important, like, you know, for developing animal models of new diseases as they come forth. You have to select for a virus that can ac actually replicate in a, a, a distinct animal that you can use in the lab. So if you don't permit gain of function research, we won't be able to respond to a new threat because we won't be able to make animal models. 
So getting that right, getting that definition right is very important. I think that the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, new guidelines for this type of research is very clear. Uh, it's a good step forward. Um, you should look at that and see what you can do best to, uh, you know, to codify that into some kind of legislation. Yeah, Dr. Ebright, do you concur with that point of view, that, that, that we need to define exactly what kind of research is okay and which is not, which has a beneficial purpose and which has only malevolent purpose? The definition of gain-of-function research has been clear. There is a legally controlling official definition from the U.S. policy that was in effect from 2014 to 2017, and there has been an official legally controlling definition in the U.S. policy that has been in effect, in effect from 2018 to the present. The definitions have never been in question, but the intensity that you asked about at the start of your series of questions, the intensity comes from those who are practitioners of gain-of-function research and related high-risk research on potential pandemic pathogens who have for two decades successfully resisted federal oversight of their activities, for two decades who have insisted on self-regulation without external oversight and who would like this to continue, despite the very real possibility, even though, as you say, not a certainty of the fact, the, the very real possibility that SARS-CoV-2, a pandemic that killed 20 million and cost 25 trillion, may have come from precisely that category of research. That is the basis of the intensity. Only after there is an acknowledgement, and I see this acknowledgement today in a bipartisan fashion among members of this committee from both parties, only after there is an acknowledgement that there is a very real possibility, not a remote possibility, but a very real possibility of a lab origin, will there be the political will to impose regulation on this scientific community that has successfully resisted and obstructed regulation for two decades. Every other component of biomedical research that poses risks or has significant consequences has regulation, federal regulation with force of law in place. There's regulation of human subjects research. There's regulation of vertebrate animal research. There's regulation of embryonic stem cell research. But in this category of research, which is the most significant in terms of consequences and potentially existential risk, there is almost no regulation with force of law. No regulation with force of law for biosafety, for any pathogen other than the smallpox virus, and no regulation with force of law for bio-risk management for any pathogen. That needs to change. That's what produces this intensity. And, and it strikes me that, that uh, uh, whether uh, COVID came from a lab or it came from a wet market, that issue still has to be addressed. Absolutely. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to get so excited about where COVID ha happened to come from. What I know is that something very dangerous could come from gain-of-function research if it's not properly regulated. How to define wh where those boundaries are and what one can do and one can't do, that's some, something that we ought to be focused on. Even if we became 98% sure it came from a, a, a wet market, that wouldn't mean that gain-of-function research could it by itself become a huge danger to humanity, and therefore we ought to regulate it. Is that is that something that you gentlemen agree with, or am I making a mistake? I, I, I completely agree with you, Senator Romney. That's well stated. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Romney. Uh, Senator Hall, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks uh, for holding this hearing. Thanks for the witnesses for being here. You know, I have to say, I think one of the worst things that happened in the COVID era is that our own government deliberately withheld information from us, from the American people, tried to propagandize the American people, used the arms and agencies of government to actively censor Americans who dared to question the propaganda, and they're still lying to us. And I'll give you the proof of it. I wrote the bill that requires the administration to declassify the intelligence, uh, intelligence assessments and reports related to the origins of COVID-19. Now listen, I just want to say, everybody sitting on this dais has read these. I've read them. I guarantee you my colleagues have read them. I know what the Energy Department concluded. I know what the FBI concluded. I knew what they concluded years ago because we could read them when people like Dr. Fauci were out there saying the lab leak hypothesis was totally discredited and nonsense. 
you could go read the intelligence and know our own government thought otherwise. And at this late hour, this government still refuses to release the intelligence. They are blatantly disregarding, blatantly disregarding the law that this body passed, the Senate passed, unanimously, unanimously. The propaganda involved in the origins of COVID-19 is astounding to me. It recalls the worst of the wartime propaganda in years past when the government would deliberately lie to people. And here that's what they have been doing with COVID-19 and are still doing it. You know, you had this whole cabal of, led by Dr. Fauci and others who as soon as the lab leak hypothesis that we now know is a lot more than a hypothesis. As soon as it's mentioned, what, what did Fauci do? We know because uh, this has all been litigated in a federal district court. In fact, in multiple federal courts, I've got the finding of fact from the court right here. They lay it all out. Fauci goes to the WHO, asks the WHO to intervene to discredit the lab leak. He then speaks against it multiple times from the podium at the White House. He then does countless media interviews. I mean, my gosh, what show has he not been on? He's still on TV, spewing this misinformation, as he would call it. But he did these multiple interviews where he says, no way, no how, lab leak, not possible at all. And then he coordinates, and the whole federal government coordinates with the biggest tech companies in the world to suppress, and media companies, to suppress any American who would ask questions about it. It's absolutely disgraceful. Dr. Gary, you were part of this propaganda effort. I mean, you were right at the center of it. It's astounding. You wrote this piece, this Nature Magazine piece or whatever it was that we've heard testimony here today, Nature Medicine, March 17, 2020. We've heard testimony here today from other scientists on the panel that it's basically an opinion piece. You said at the time, that definitively SARS-CoV-2 is not a laboratory construct, is not a laboratory construct. Of course, our own government, key agencies have concluded otherwise. And on the basis of this, Dr. Fauci and others cited this, this piece and went out to use it to mobilize our own government to censor people who ask questions about it. People lost their jobs because of this. They lost their jobs, they lost their standing, they were kicked off Facebook, they were kicked off Twitter. Do you regret being part of this effort, this propaganda effort? Sir, I, I, was, I was simply just writing a paper about our scientific opinions about where this virus came from. Oh, no, from. you weren't. You said in an email <laughs> that we now have that you tried to withhold, but that we have February 2nd, 2020, you wrote, I really can't think of a plausible natural scenario where you can get from the bat virus or one very similar to it to this. I, I'm quoting you. I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature. It's stunning. Of course, in the lab, it would be easy. Well, of course. And I actually figured it out. That's the whole point of it. You that. figured it out? You, you wrote this while you were writing your propaganda piece, I, while I, you were writing your paper. I wrote that paper. somewhere around February 2nd. We yeah, Feb it was exactly the, February 2nd. Next, and you've testified so. that you were writing your proximal origin paper in early February. So you're, you're saying that what, what, did it come to you overnight? There was new data that like, came Like uh, a revelation from God. No. It's Overnight you concluded, method. I got it. I got it. I figured it out. I figured it out. And now I can definitively rule out. It's amazing. Is that what happened? It's just the scientific method. Oh, it's just science. Oh, it's the scientific method that happened at lightning speed and then was used to propagandize and lie to and shut down. As a scientist who's supposedly su supposed to follow facts, do you regret the fact that your work was used to censor your fellow scientists? It was used to censor ordinary Americans who ask questions about the virus? Do you, do you regret you know, that? When, when you write a paper, I mean, you get it in the journal. I, we can't control what happens after Oh, that. I see. So you're not yeah. responsible at all. This is, it's amazing. Nobody who is involved in any of this is responsible. Never. Yeah. They're not responsible. Yeah. Since, People have it, lost their jobs. Yeah. People have lost probably their health care associated with their jobs. People have been run out of public. They're not available in polite society. You can't show your face because, my gosh, you question. Yeah. But you, you don't have anything to do with it. Why have so many of your papers, your other papers, been retracted or subjected to formal expressions of concern? Yeah, well, Why is that? Th there's a long story behind that. Um, Four those, of them, those, right? Those, I mean, those... you've, you've had an, in July 26, 2021, Virology retracted a paper of yours. 
Also in 2021, the Journal of General Virology retracted another of your papers. In March of 2022, an expression of concern was added by an editor of yet another journal to another of your papers. In April 4th of 2024, a third scientific paper of yours was retracted from the Journal of Medical Virology. Yeah. Is this normal? Th th those papers didn't come from my lab, but, you know, I'm certainly helping. They're them. not yours? They're not mine, no. Oh, so so your, I'm your on work the paper, is, but they did not come. The work from my that, lab. that God gave you in a flash of inspiration remains absolutely un, unimpeachable, unimpeached. I, I, we stand by that. Do uh, you stand by your your assertion uh, and your nature piece that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not a laboratory construct? Could not. Be. Uh, we do, and that's exactly the same. Couldn't uh, possibly be conclusion that the intelligence community came to. Oh no, sure, that is a lie. Let's stop right there. Well, it's that right I is right a lie. I okay. have read the intelli the intelligence community did not come to that conclusion. Multiple intelligence community agents and components have concluded it was likely a lab leak. And they concluded that at the same time that you and your people were propagandizing the American public and using the channels and influence of the American government to censor ordinary Americans. Yeah. That is the truth. I'm not going to sit here and allow you to lie any further. I'm, Dr. I'm not, Gary, I'm not you have through. disgracefully participated in shameful propaganda that has been one of the worst chapters in this country's history with the government propagandizing its own people. And you know what? You may be right about the lab. I'm not a scientist. I don't know. But what I do know is, what I do know is, it is wrong. It is wrong to censor and lie to the American public. It is wrong to withhold critical information from them. Yeah. And it is wrong to countenance that and to say, oh, I just had nothing to do with it. Gee, I wish we could have done better. You should have done better, sir. You should have done better. And because you didn't, people have suffered. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I, yeah, could I Dr. Gary, if you'd respond. like to respond, I think you can yeah, respond sure. to your question. Yeah. So, I, actually, Senator Hawley, I'm going to agree with you so, with, about something. I, I do think that, that we should learn more information from the intelligence community, what they found. Uh, I agree with you that they should be more open uh, and tell where those conclusions came from, you know, at the FBI and at the Energy Department, all the agencies should come forth with, with more information. So there's, there's a point we can agree with. I mean, that was an interesting exchange, but you know, I, all we did was write a paper, <laughs> Nature Medicine, and 3,000 words. It's been one of the most uh, scrutinized papers in history. It's held up very well. It wasn't an attempt to, to uh, you know, distort things and to mislead the American public. It was just simply a paper. Uh, like the many other scientific papers that I've written in my, Very good. In my career. Let's, uh, we'll move on to, to a uh, second round. Uh, we, I'll say, tell the members we have a vote that I believe has already been called. We also have a hard stop at uh, a little after 12. So the second round will be uh, five uh, minutes. Um, and I'll start. Actually, Doctor, I'll just pick up uh, from your answer there. A lot of, has been directed towards the, the paper that you wrote and the right. sure. research that went in into that. Uh, does the science uh, sense uh, the paper uh, came out uh, strengthen your argument or weaken it? Uh, what does the science show? It, it absolutely could... strengthens it. I mean, we published a series of papers after the Proximal Origins paper, all of them, you know, conclusively moving towards the, the uh, you know, the natural origin hypothesis. So nothing, you know, we stand by that paper. It was a good paper. We, uh, we're currently uh, seeing enormous uh, changes uh, in technology in the biological sciences from artificial intelligence to biological design tools, uh, even uh, robot laboratories where experiments uh, can be conducted from really anywhere on the globe. Dr. Uh, Koblenz, my, my question for you is, in your opinion, will these types of technological changes make it easier or or harder for us to determine the origins of future, future pandemics? Uh, the, the advances you just discussed will definitely make it more complicated to do that. Uh, on the one hand, we are going to have much more sophisticated capabilities to uh, analyze viral genomes and do the kind of analyses that are, are some of the feature of Dr. Gary's work to understand the evolution of these pathogens and, and where they come from. And so that will be incredibly useful in investigating any future um, uh, outbreak. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that there are, these technologies are going to be globally diffused, the fact that there are a growing number of high and maximum containment laboratories that conduct high consequence research will make it uh, a more complicated process because there will be more potential sources for 
uh, outbreaks, whether they are, they're naturally occurring or, or from laboratories. So um, the technologies are not a net negative, but they're not a panacea, and, but it's definitely going to be a much more complicated endeavor to, to go through this exercise in the future. Very good. Dr. Quay, a question uh, for, for, for you. Uh, we, we know the, uh, the U.S. intelligence community has reported that, uh, that a few scientists uh, at the uh, Wuhan lab uh, got sick uh, in December, uh, the, the fall of uh, 2019. Uh, but it's not clear that any of them had COVID-19. So my, my question for you, sir, is what evidence do we have that someone at the Wuhan lab got COVID-19 before anyone else did? And uh, do you know if these scientists actually got tested for COVID-19? Uh, no, I don't. I, all of my data around that uh, relies on this, the State Department uh, statement. There were three individuals. Uh, we believe we know one of them, at least, uh, Ben Hu, was responsible for some of the synthetic work in the laboratory. A uh, reasonably young person who was hospitalized, uh, who is said to have been hospitalized with a uh, uh, X-ray uh, confirmed a disease consistent with COVID-19, but not blood testing. Uh, we do know also that in in May of uh, Mar March of 2020, uh, Dr. Shi reported that no one at the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, had uh, SARS-CoV-2. And with uh, another individual, we did a statistical analysis of the probability of that with the incidents in Wuhan, and that is not a truthful statement uh, because of that. It, so those are those are the two facts I have. Dr. Gary, you want to yeah. respond? Se Senator Peters, could I uh, read from the uh, Intelligence Committee, the Office, Director of Office of National Intelligence, about these three supposed sick uh, workers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology? And they write, while several WIV research researchers fell mildly ill in fall 2019, they experienced a range of symptoms consistent with colds or allergies with accompanying sy symptoms typically not associated with COVID-19, and some of them were confirmed to have been sick with other illnesses unrelated to COVID-19. So those, the three sick workers at the web is simply a myth. Uh, Dr. Kuei, um, what specific hard evidence uh, proves that the Wuhan lab uh, did experiments that, that created the virus? Do we have specific hard evidence? No, one of our biggest challenges is we don't know what they've done inside there. We, we know what they were doing in the past. We know what they did in the fall of 2019, all consistent with the things you would do if there had been a laboratory accident there. You know, filing a patent, the first patent out of 600 patents for a, a device to prevent a coronavirus infection in an infected worker. One of the inventors on that patent is a PLA military doctor scientist. Um, the, head of the, uh, the head of the laboratory was dismissed, and, and a PLA uh, soldier was put in charge of the laboratory December 2019. So um, we don't have access inside the laboratory. We probably will never have it. But the genome inside the virus comports to the diffuse grant in such a way that it's, uh, it's inconsistent. I mean, in a court of law, you find someone criminally in, 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 for 95 percent or greater probabilities, and this is one in a billion, which is greater than that, that this is a synthetic virus. So I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I mean, a lot of this is these are assumptions that you're making, uh, not not hard evidence. Uh, the hard evidence is the incidence of the features of SARS-CoV-2 can individually be looked at in nature. They can be identified with the frequency in nature. And then you can, you can say, what is the chance that each of these were combined in one virus at the same time? This is, what, this is what virologists do all the time in looking for origins. And when you do that, you conclude that it has a one in a billion chance of coming from nature, and it meets all seven criteria of the diffuse grant. Okay, thank you. Ranking Member Paul, you're recognized for questions. Dr. Gary indicated that the intelligence community was um, somewhat unified, or a lot of them believe this came from animals, and that's just not true. The ones that have been vocal about this and talked a lot about it have been the DOE, which has more scientists than any other agency in Washington, probably other than NIH. Uh, they've concluded that it did come from the lab. FBI concluded it came from the lab, and we asked a whistleblower from the CIA that says the scientists that were convened to study this 
voted six to one to say it came from the lab, and then they were overruled by superiors for political reasons. So there's a lot of evidence that uh, people within the intel agencies actually do believe that there is evidence that it came from the lab. In addition to people getting sick, there's also about a week in October where they do uh, imagery of who's using a cell phone, and nobody's using a cell phone in the lab for about a week. So the, whole, the lab's completely empty for about a week, and some people think that was during a cleanup period. But if you're sitting at home and you're sort of an independent, you hear scientists over here saying gain of function is the best thing since sliced bread, and over here you're saying, well, we really haven't developed any meaningful uh, vaccines or technology from this, you're like, who do I believe? And who you believe does go to character. And so we have to look at some of the statements. Like I say, I've never seen anything like this between public and private statements. So Christian Anderson, early on in this, sends an email to Fauci, and his Fauci uh, says, Bob, Bob Gary, and a couple of the other virologists, we think it's inconsistent. This virus, this genetic sequence of COVID, is inconsistent with the expectations of evolutionary theory. So they, they believed it didn't come from nature. They had looked at this. These are smart people that when they were not looking at it, when they were trying to look at it through an objective lens, concluded one thing until they came to another conclusion that it might hurt the business of science and the arrangements they had going on with China and concluded opposite. But with Christian Anderson, it's stark, it's stark because he says, oh, Bob, and all these, oh, we all believe it's inconsistent with the expectations of evolutionary theory. A week later, Christian Anderson is saying, what I like to use when I talk to the public is, I like to tell them it's consistent with the expectations of evolutionary theory. So he goes from inconsistent to consistent, complete opposite approach within days, maybe even simultaneously as these papers are being written. So really the hypocrisy of those involved and those who are saying not a laboratory construct, if you wanna know who to believe, Look at their private statements versus their public statements. So we have gain of function is the best thing since sliced bread or gain of function is a real problem. Now, Senator Romney's like, well, why does it matter if there's a chance we should do something? I think he's right. If you believe there's a 1% chance we should do something. But if you think there's a 1% chance or you want to sort of glad hand people at the end and say, well, we should do something, their argument for the people who think it's not likely to happen is going to be, oh, the administration's already fixed this. It's already done, and all we need is a few little regulatory things. We don't need legislation. We don't need independent oversight. We don't need people looking at this who aren't on the receiving end of the money. This is the whole problem of NIH. The people regulating themselves are getting the money. So the administration has put in place some regulations to try to you know, help with the buying of select agents. And Dr. Quay, if you could explain to us uh, what a few MIT scientists did recently and how well the administrative regulations are working without actual congressional legislation. Sure. So three scientists at MIT said they were going to be a red team, and they contacted the FBI because what they were going to do was about to be potentially illegal. Uh, and they put together ricin and the, and the 1918 influenza. Um, th those two are select agents, and they're, they're you know, Highly lethal, um, and they broke up. They broke the genes up in a in a particular way. They added some benign genes, and then they put out test orders, uh, following uh, roughly following the the White House guidelines. Test orders to see if if laboratories would send them the pieces they needed to build these viruses or ricin, um, you know, or or they would stop them. Uh, and in fact, in 94 percent of the time, they they sent the pieces right to them. They purposely didn't make the active strain of the RNA. They made the, the inactive strain to show that they could do it. But they proved they could make rice, and they proved they could make the 1918 influenza under the guidance that have just come out of the White House in a way that... Uh, that, that but this is, gets at where we go forward. Our next hearing, or one of our next hearings, is going to be, what do we do for gain-of-function reform? What kind of committee do we set up to look at this? And if the answer is, from the other side, oh, it's already done, the White House did it, this is showing you what the White House did, even if it was well-intentioned, didn't work. These scientists got the material off the internet to create the Spanish flu that killed 50, 100 million people. So this is not something we should scoff at and say, oh, it's not a laboratory construct. We don't do anything here. Let the administration do this. And I would say this if it were a Republican administration. I don't care which party it's in. I agree with scientists like Kevin Esfeld who equate this with nuclear weapons. This is incredibly important and needs congressional oversight on the select agents, but also on the gain of function. 
Now, some people think this just started. It's incredibly uh, partisan. And I'll just for a quick answer, then a more extensive answer. Uh, Dr. E. Bright, are you part of the right-wing conspiracy? Are you uh, somehow some kind of crazy Republican partisan? I'm a registered Democrat. I voted for Biden. I had a Biden sign on my lawn <laughs> and had a Biden bumper sticker on my car. All right, that's enough, that. that's enough of that. But the, the, main, the main point I wanted to make is this isn't a partisan thing. In fact, when I've talked to Dr. E. Bright, he says he got involved with this after 9-11 when the anthrax attacks came. Um, but then more involved in 2010 as it heated up and everybody was talking about in the scientific community when scientists took the avian flu, which is very, very deadly in humans, but like most animal virus, not very transmissible in humans, and they mutated it. Uh, Fouchier and others in, in, in Netherlands to make it spread through the air and to spread to mammals. That's a crazy thing. And if people think that's a benign use of gain of function, we should never, ever listen to people like that. Who else thinks it was benign and we didn't need to do anything? Anthony Fauci. There have been these two camps. There has been this debate going on for a decade. I think this is a very good debate. It should be an intellectual debate. But realize these are the people, Collins and, and Fauci, who were saying, take these people down. Take down the people we disagree with. This is not scientific debate. They were taking us off the Internet. These are people are not playing under the American rules, not playing under the scientific method, and they should be discounted. But we have to have a real debate over this. So as we move forward, and I'd like to ask you, Dr. Ebright, on this, how important is it that we actually have a law passed and that we actually have regulators that are scientists but that are outside of the uh, supply of money, outside of the exchange of grant money? I think it's a matter of survival. It's that important. There needs to be an entity that is independent of agencies that fund research and perform research to eliminate the structural conflict of interest that has existed with current self-regulation by agencies that perform and fund research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Johnson, we're going to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, in, in Eisenhower's very prescient uh, farewell speech, he not only warned us about the military industrial complex, he, he warned us about government funding of research. He said, uh, if you do that, scientists are going to be more interested in their grant and obtaining a grant than pursuing truthful science. He said you end up with a scientific and technological elite that would drive public policy. And I think we witnessed that during COVID. They drove it in a very bad direction. So I want to talk about the cover-up again. Uh, Dr. Gary, how much have you received in government grants over your career? Do you have any figure in that, a ballpark? Sir, I'm not sure. Um, hundreds of millions? Back. Not hundreds. So, so I have information that between you and uh, Dr. Kirsten Anderson, since 2020, between 2020 and 2022, you received $25.2 million in grants from the NIH. That's possible. That's yeah. accurate. Okay, so, so after you write the proximal origin theory, you've been working with Dr. Fauci how many years? Well, I don't actually work De directly decades. with Dr. Fauci. De but well, I mean, you've been, but you've been, <laughs> you, you've certainly come to his aid and, and testified kind of in his... Uh, uh, support during during AIDS, um, but the fact is, you 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 cashiered twenty five point two million dollars in government grants after writing the proximal origin paper, didn't you? Twenty five point two million dollars in grants, and again, it's Anthony it, it Fauci. Wasn't, it wasn't because we wrote Anthony that, Fauci has, has let out yeah. billions of dollars worth of grants, right? He controls an awful lot of information. Again, the point being, you know, wh why would they cover it up? December or January twenty seventh, twenty twenty, Doctor Fauci is informed via email that NAIID has been funding coronavirus, coronavirus project in China for the last five years. Okay, he, so he's given, these are the emails that uh, were FOIA'd, they weren't given to us, and they're heavily redacted. Uh, January 31st, he starts conversations with Dr. Anderson you know, and et al., uh, Dr. Gary. February 1st, Dr. Fauci emails, and my screen went dead on me here, uh, rats. Do you have that? F Fauci emails his uh, principal deputy director, Hugh Austin Slots. And he here is the. He said, is he, Hugh, it is essential that we speak this AM. Keep your 
cell phone on. I have a conference call at 745. They are, will likely be over at 845. Read this paper as well as the email that I will forward to you. You will have tasks today that must be done. Now, that, that is somebody who's scrambling to cover up his backside for funding dangerous research at the Wuhan lab for five years. Is, is that correct? Dr. Ebright, I'll, I'll let, ask you that question. But in addition, you, you've basically accused Dr. Gary of scientific misconduct, possibly serious as fraud. Why don't, why don't you just address that? Because I would agree with you. Uh, so uh, both on the proximal origin paper, I have signed two letters by teams of scientists requesting an, uh, requesting an editorial review of that paper for retraction for misconduct. And then on two of the market papers, there are only four published, sorry, only okay, two But again, what was the misconduct you're, okay, so you've accused him, but what was the misconduct you're The primary misconduct, him? the misconduct of highest importance was stating conclusions the authors knew at the time, contemporaneously, while writing the paper, submitting the paper, and publishing the paper were untrue. This is the most egregious form of scientific misconduct, publishing a paper where you know the conclusions are untrue. And of course, the reasons, the reason we didn't get those emails other than through a court order is that the emails themselves were so unbelievably incriminating that, is that they, they thought one thing and wrote the exact other for an article that was quoted like 5,800 times. I mean, that, again, as Senator Hawley and others have pointed out, destroyed people's careers. They were ridiculed. They were vilified. Yes. That, that is scientific misconduct and fraud. And, and, and Dr. Gary, I have to say, if people are bemoaning the, the fact that people no longer trust science or that uh, we don't trust our federal health agencies, the reason the American public legitimately don't trust scientists and federal health agencies are because of people like you. You bear that responsibility for violating the public's trust from your scientific misconduct and fraud. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> think, uh, Dr. Gary, you, uh, you yeah, can. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would just encourage people to go and read the Nature Medicine article, The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. We didn't put anything in that paper that we didn't believe was true. The conclusions of that paper have held up very well. In fact, there's been an abundance of scientific evidence that has come forward since then to support all the conclusions, everything we wrote in that paper. So there's no fraud. Yes, indeed, some of the authors changed their mind during the course of writing that paper over a period of, of weeks. That's not fraud, sir. That is just the way that the scientific method so, works. So, Mr. Chairman, I would ask consent to enter all these Slack messages from this, you know, Dr. Anderson et al., that group, uh, that have all these quotes into our hearing record, and we'll provide them to you. Thank you. Objection. Senator Marshall, you recognize your questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Gary, I think it's also important to point out a couple of things, and one is that you've received $60 million of grants from the NIH over the years, and you have your own vaccine company. And, and that obviously is a bit of a conflict of interest, and I don't think the scientific world really agrees with your conclusion that it stood up to the test of times. I, I think the Proximal Origins article is literally an editorial, literally an editorial, an opinion page. But unfortunately, our intelligence community took it as the gospel. I think it's also interesting to me that in, within the scientific community, that two agencies, the Department of Energy and FBI, said they lean towards a lab leak origin of this. That's public knowledge. And that they had the scientists to actually understand what the heck we're talking about. They're realizing that there's no way you can, that nature could have, could have made this virus. There's so many things wrong with your, uh, your, your theory. And all you come back to is, oh, it started in, in uh, the wet market. But you've yet to show us. Um, the, an intermediate host, you've let to, you have to show us progenitor species, all the, the farms that farm these animals outside of the market, how many of those animals were positive? I think the, you know, the answer is none. I want to go down this ODNI route for just a second. And it's a fact that the ODNI um, has not complied with the law. Congress has passed legislation to declassify information related to COVID origins. ODNI has not complied. Placing, leaving ODNI in charge ensures a total 
uh, monitor and control the information, the misinformation. That's why we have to move this investigation outside of the ODNI. Additionally, it's a fact that our current grant research process hides the ultimate beneficiaries of U.S. grants research and bypasses all export controls. All of that has to be changed. This is why we need a 9-11 style investigation outside of cameras, outside of the politics here on Capitol Hill to find out wh where this virus came from, uh, what did the U.S. do to contribute, and how do we keep this from happening again? Uh, Dr. Quay, I want to go back to some line of question we were going down earlier, that just the research being done in Wuhan, China. I think that there's a naivety upon Americans to think that the Chinese military is in one's place doing research and, and the WIV is doing research and the CCP is not involved. What's it like to work in, in labs in Wuhan and the interaction between the CCP and those entities? What does their day usually start with? Well, I think one of the, the telling ways to see that is without visiting them is to go through the minutes of laboratory meetings, which you can, you can get a hold of. They're in Chinese. You can translate them. Uh, and unlike uh, laboratory meetings in the U.S., which are pretty much you start out, you start presenting your data, you challenge your data and that, they start with a recitation of what the Communist Party's missions are with respect to their, 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 their position in the world and the role of their research, and it goes down a litany. Uh, and these are by Communist Party uh, members who are part of every lab meeting uh, at present, uh, and, then, and then they finally start talking about the, the research uh, into the lab, but not at the beginning. And then the military takes over the WIV in December uh, as well to, to promote the, co the cover-up. What is the interaction between the Chinese military and the WIV scientists? Well, so the woman that took over was the one that, that was most responsible for the response uh, to the SARS-1. Uh, and interestingly, if you look at the closest viruses to SARS-CoV-2, so you got RITG13, which is inside the WIV. You've got, you've got uh, the Bainel viruses from Laos. We know WIV is sampling there. The next one down are two viruses that were uh, collected by the PLA Army and we began studying in 2017. The S2 region of the spike protein is almost identical to those viruses that were originally collected by the PLA Army. The first genetic cluster of patients that had both lineage A, lineage B, were in the PLA hospital three kilometers from the WIV. Okay. You know, I think we've debated back and forth about the benefits and risk of viral gain-of-function research, and I'm just going to say viral manipulation viral manipulation, so we don't have to worry about your silly definitions that are used to obscure uh, the, what's really happening here. I'm going to ask each one of you, do you feel comfortable funding any type of viral manipulation research with foreign entities that are hostile towards America, like the CCP? Dr. Abright? I think there are are strong reasons for international collaboration in science with both allied nations and adversary nations. However, there's a line that never should be crossed, and that is research that has weapons implications. And research on discovery and enhancement of bioweapons agents, like the research on SARS viruses in Wuhan, most surely is an example of right. such research. I'd like to go through the questions, but I, I think I should be respectful of everyone's time. And thank you so much, Chairman, for giving us a second round. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator Marshall. Uh, one, one quick question came up for me. Uh, Dr. Cray, uh, you, you talked about the genetic features could only happen in, in a lab. And I'd just like to ask Dr. Gary, uh, um, uh, do the genetic features, do those, could those only come from lab experiments, or is there a natural uh, uh, of, uh, evolution? Of, of course of not. I mean, Dr. Quay mentioned the, the virus called Banal 2052. That virus is extremely close to SARS-CoV-2. In fact, if we isolated both of those viruses out in nature and didn't know anything about a, <clears throat> a pandemic, you would say those are, you know, in the same very close family together. So Banal 52 is is essentially a very close member of, of SARS-CoV-2. It's got all the genetic features of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, certainly the fact that that virus is in nature shows that SARS-CoV-2 could, could have arisen through a natural process. Dr. Ebert? A virus has no furin cleavage site, as Dr. Gary is aware. I mean, the furin cleavage site is not the only feature of the virus that, that makes it... Um, a virus that's able to, to cause a pandemic. There, there are dozens, maybe hundreds of other changes that the virus has to go through before it can, uh, 
you know, have that potential. Nobody in a laboratory would know how to put those features into any virus, um, let alone one that's, uh, you know, 97 or 96 percent similar to, to SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Clay? When you passage a virus, uh, when you do serial passage of a virus, Darwin and evolution uh, selects for the right positions. So when you look at 3,800 possible changes in the amino acids and the receptor binding domain, all but 17 changes are, are not improvements. So SARS-CoV-2 is at 99% perfected for the receptor binding domains of humans. SARS-1, when it first jumped to humans, had 15% and evolved over a couple years to get to the pandemic stage. Uh, you started out with a 99% yeah. perfect virus, which is serial passage. So, uh, Dr. Quay, the banal 52 virus, the receptor binding domain is uh, 50 amino acids long. 49 of those 50 are the same as in SARS-CoV-2. You don't have to, you know, create any kind of scenario where you're passing viruses in a lab, you know, that, that RBD, the receptor binding domain, is already in nature, essentially fully formed. Very good. Um, so, uh, Ranking Member Paul and I uh, are holding uh, these hearings, and we want to be thinking about the future. Uh, how do we uh, make sure that we uh, handle pandemics uh, or potential pandemics much better uh, in the future? So I'm going to ask each of you um, a brief question. In, in the event that we never get to the bottom of uh, how this uh, pandemic started, uh, both Ranking Member Paul and I believe that we've got to do everything we can uh, to put forward policies that will hopefully prevent a future uh, pandemic. So I'd like each of you to identify, I'm going to go down, I'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Koblenz and then go down, just to identify briefly in the remaining time here, one or two priority actions that we should take to help us prevent the next pandemic? If there's one or two thoughts that this committee should take to heart, what would that be? Dr. Koblitz? So uh, in order to address the threat of uh, the natural zoonotic spillover pandemic, uh, there really needs to be a One Health approach to, to biosurveillance and preventing spillover in key countries that have, um, you know, um, ecologically are prime for, for disease emergence. For the um, uh, lab, uh, origin possibilities, we, we need a much stronger global architecture for bio-risk management. Uh, and underlying all that, we need a much stronger biosurveillance system, both domestically and internationally, to detect these outbreaks as soon as possible uh, and guide the medical and public health responses we need to prevent outbreaks from becoming pandemics. Dr. Gary? I mean, I guess my recommendation would be, would be a very practical one. I mean, we have um, bird flu in our dairy cattle in the United States, at, as we're speaking here. Um, that's a very dangerous virus. I would, I would take a look at that and see what we can do to, um, you know, keep the unthinkable from happening in that virus acquiring extra features, maybe recombination of the virus from a pig, maybe recombination of the virus from human, to turn that into a virus that would be very, very difficult to uh, control its spread right now with our current technologies. Thank you. Dr. Gray? Uh, four recommendations. One is to move the oversight of select agent research uh, and gain a function outside of NIH, NIAID, uh, and into some independent uh, institutional review board. You could model it after uh, human research boards, institutional review boards, number one. Uh, and number two uh, is, is uh, taking Western biotechnology equipment, which right now is the superior equipment, U.S., U.K. primarily, and putting it under export control. So at least we know where the machines are going, and perhaps we could put some controls over it. Uh, number f uh, three is, is uh, simple. Uh, don't put these next to line, to, you know, subways where, where accidents can happen. Uh, and number four, gain of opportunity where you don't necessarily do viral research, but you go out and try to collect a virus that has, it's in a cave, it has no chance of running into a human, you bring it back to a city with 11 million people, uh, you purify it out of a sample for feces where there's, uh, you know, 200 other viruses, you make it pure, you make it 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth, you know, a million more copies of it, setting up a, a laboratory accident. Gain of opportunity has the same risks as gain of, uh, uh, of, of gain of function. We should look at those. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ebert. Legislation should address three subjects. The first is establishing a review entity that is independent of agencies that fund biomedical research and perform biomedical research to eliminate the conflict of interest that exists today. Two, 
the oversight must cover all forms of research irrespective of funding source, not only federally funded research, but also other funded research, and must cover research both unclassified and classified in character. And three, these, uh, these, these improvements in oversight need to be codified in law so that they are enforceable with rule of law. Voluntary self-regulation, voluntary guidance, and best practices have not worked, and they will not work in the future. So legislation for an independent review, legislation for a comprehensive review, irrespective of funding source and classification status, and legislation for enforceable oversight with force of law. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank each of our witnesses here for joining us today, for your testimony, for your expertise. Appreciate your concrete solutions as to next steps going forward, and we'll likely reach out to you again and again to continue to flesh out uh, these, uh, these ideas. Pandemics and, and other infectious disease outbreaks um, will unfortunately be a, an enduring threat to our country uh, and to our world. And while the question uh, of the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, remains uh, unresolved, I think it is, it's clear that there are things that we can and must uh, pursue to reduce biological risk uh, here at home uh, and, uh, uh, and abroad. Uh, I hope this committee's work will also result in restoring and maintaining uh, the trust in public health uh, agencies and the scientific process, as we will need to make sure uh, uh, we're doing that to prevent uh, future pandemics in this country. I look forward to our continuing work together to improve the federal government's ability to prevent, to detect, and to respond to biological threats. Uh, the record for this hearing will remain open for 15 days until 5 p.m. on July 3rd of 2024 for the submission of statements and questions for the record. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned. Hey, you do okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <it's really> great. <laughs>